Why hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 435, that's 4, 3, 5, how are you guys doing my friends, how are you doing, great, amazing, good to hear, how am I, you know, hanging in there, doing the best I can with the time I have available during this unprecedented unprecedented time of joy and happiness my words are getting muddled up there because i'm losing some of my brain cells anyway if it's your first time check out the show via youtube make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe leave me a comment down below and do all that good stuff share if you're listening via the podcast app please download the show share it with your friends leave me a five star review send the show to your mother via an sms link and all those things in between and so of course support via patreon is always more than welcome at patreon.com for us agostinho for a free bonus show if you're only subscribed to patreon there's the, the tier start from one dollar the equivalent of one pound get on patreon hear some absolutely diabolical stories from you, my, yours truly only told on patreon behind that paywall so get involved there for bonus episodes and bonus content of the Agassino Zynga show. I'm going to be pumping it out on there on a regular basis. So make sure you jump on there and get involved at patreon.com forward slash A G O S T I N H O. Sorry about that. <clears throat> at patreon.com forward slash A G O S T I N H O. Get involved. Link in the description below and all that good stuff. Anyway, how are you guys doing? How's life? How's tricks? How's the situation? Good? Yes, amazing. Um, how's it going with me? Same old, innit? You know, just trying to keep my head above water as everyone else is doing. But thankfully, there is some light in the tunnel. Um, I think I mentioned in the previous podcast. This is sort of feeling like, you know, I saw him. Oh, there you go. Finally, got got it out of my mouth. I don't know what that was, but this guy. This is a bit yucky, but hey, you move on. I saw recently a story about Bobby Schmurda supposedly has six days left of his sentence, right? And I'm pretty sure those are going to be the longest six days of his entire life. You know, there are probably periods of his sentence where it went past very quickly, some very slow. But I'd assume when you hit the long, the kind of home stretch, it, you know, um, time can't go by. Time can't go by quick enough. And I feel the same thing is sort of happening with COVID, especially in the UK. We've kind of vaccinated a whole bunch of people. We are just about getting to the point where we can finally start to reach out and touch our normal lives again we can smell um you know um, freedom of movement to do what we like it's on the horizon but we just have to wait a little bit longer um i guess you know it's better than nothing it's better than you know last year what um, october november when there was so much uncertainty and we didn't really know what was going to happen and i threw out all of my kind of pessimistic opinions about the whole lockdown opening up but it looks like there's a lot of things to be hopeful for and to kind of um you know keep you somewhat sane for these last few weeks and months as we kind of head into us going back to normality but you know it's still a bit of a stretch but what else have i been doing in between then oh um watching reading watching lots of movies watching lots of tv series banging out books watching documentaries i managed to smash through the entirety of can't get you out of my head a documentary by adam curtis the new hit documentary by legendary documentary filmmaker adam curtis that was pretty decent some six hour watch maybe six hour plus a couple of episodes were like an hour and 10 20 minutes but it's well worth it i'll talk about that later in the pod and what else i did and then i finished you know um your honor a great little um mini series that was on showtime i'm sure they've actually greenlit a season two which is annoying you kind of want it just to end on season one but you know i get it you have to milk what you can you know brian cranston is it my Brian Cranston, Mike Cranston, whatever his name is, the guy from Breaking Bad fucking smashes it. So I'll talk about that later as well. Um, and then, yeah, that's it. And then, of course, spending loads of time on Twitter, actually, right? More time than I've ever done in my entire life. And this makes me think two things. I think, first of all, it kind of has some sort of relation with the Can't Get It On My Head documentary by Adam Curtis, where essentially the premise of it is quite optimistic. The idea is, or, you know, what he's basically arguing is that we've had loads of years where, you know, governments and dark forces have tried to somehow engineer and manipulate the way we think, feel and, you know, interact with the world. 
but it hasn't necessarily worked to the extent that they thought it would work. We've kind of maybe got ourselves in trouble and issues and kind of got ourselves in mind traps just for our own ignorance and need um, whatever to do whatever we want. But by and large, we're quite free. We can kind of make our own decisions if we kind of mobilize and get together and decide enough is enough of this certain thing or whatever it may be, we can make the change that's needed in order to for, for us to have a bigger and brighter future. So it's pretty optimistic, right? But the thing that was interesting about it, I think, what did I learn? Oh yeah, so Twitter. So I've been I've been spending a lot of time more time on Twitter than I would have done previously because obviously lockdown and you're just spending a lot more time on your phone, a lot more time on your laptop, a lot more time just at home, just you know wasting time doing shit you wouldn't probably do if the world was open. I know I wouldn't do anyway in that regard. And um, what I've noticed, because again I try my best to follow as many accounts on my Twitter that are kind of you know. Um, occupy both sides of the political aisle you'd say the right and the left but by and large Twitter is basically home of the hot takes from what I've seen like people are bending over backwards I follow a couple of dudes on there who are like you know every 20 minutes or so they are constructing some sort of contrarian hot take in the hopes of getting likes and retweets that's essentially what it is or memes right sharing funny videos which kind of um, has been something I've enjoyed a lot right you kind of I feel like you get a lot of the memes a lot of the viral content content i guess but on other social media platforms usually originates from twitter then it kind of permeates to other places or uh, sometimes facebook as well but usually uh, i think it mostly comes from twitter you usually get the trashy stuff from facebook like the fighting and the karen's things but some of the funniest stuff usually occurs on twitter but the constant need for hot takes is just so annoying to read and to kind of absorb just as a person on the outside like there's this one guy i think he's a journalist called chris black who i follow um he's so annoying he's so corny like this white guy that kind of you know has a take on any everything cultural um you know pretends to like rap music but then doesn't like playboy carty like loads of weird shit that he does right just to kind of cause a bit of controversy um and just kind of consistently putting out these you know middle of the road fairly benign cultural contrarian takes that are meant to elicit some sort of reaction and it is you know it is what it is and there's loads of guys like that and girls too that exist on that platform and they just you know they're so exhausting to follow but you just it's sort of a weird place you end up kind of hate following people because you just want to see what those kind of people are talking about because the algorithm and how it's set up on twitter is that sometimes you get to see what somebody likes um you get to see what sometimes sometimes someone replies to depending on their privacy settings so you kind of get a kind of glimpse into their world which i really like so like i said I, I try my best to follow i follow like loads of tories loads of like ardent labor supporters right because i want to get an idea because it's, it's great especially when you know pretty patel says something really mad it's great to hear what that dominic dominique something that black girl that's a conservative that makes sure this girl is conservative and then to also get the view of femi right the other black guy that wears all those colorful t-shirts and you know um just he wears t-shirts every day and just talks about politics all day long i can't imagine a more um depressing life to be honest right <laughs> consisting of honestly haven't you had like think about it right this entire time that we've been locked indoors has just been a political warfare from you know from the stuff that's been occurring in the uk to the states the stuff that's happening in europe by by and large i think the people that are actually on the front lines that should be there are there but then all of us because we don't have anything else to do and occupy our time we're also getting drawn into it when we shouldn't we're all ignoramuses we're dumb dumbs we shouldn't be anywhere near it whatsoever we don't have we don't have anything of substance to provide we're not going to advance a conversation or move the needle in any substantial way it's an absolute waste of time and i cannot wait until life turns to normal so that people like myself can just retract can just kind of remove myself from the conversation and allow the people that would be doing it anyway to continue you look at the stuff that's happening in spain now with that rapper right that got arrested um you know for um for some anti-monarchy lyrics um the people that are meant to be supporting him and who are you know barricading him barricading him in a university risking their lives going to jail overnight getting fined they were going to be there you know sans lockdown you know sans virus they were going to be there anyway because they're about this life that's what they committed their life to right they're starting maybe they're probably studying some sort of political major in college but you and i shouldn't be anywhere near that that shouldn't be any of our concern we should be worrying about how to keep a roof over our heads make sure our you know family are all right going on a couple of holidays attending a festival you know 
eating some flipping overpriced pizza in the middle of Soho. That's what we should be worried about. We shouldn't be concerned about the socioeconomic um, struggles of people in the inner city. Like we don't have any knowledge. We don't know what we're doing. We can just about pay a light bill. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's honestly so um, illuminating to see that kind of discourse on Twitter, but also so tiring. I think to myself, God damn it, I'm so... I'm so um, happy that I have hobbies that don't consist of, you know, being interested in politics. I honestly cannot imagine anything worse than that. The only thing worse I can imagine uh, being an ardent political fan and knowing everyone's names and bills that are getting passed and legislation that's coming in, all this sort of nonsense, is being an ardent fan of celebrity TV shows or reality TV shows for the for the most part. That's the comparable, right? Being like an, a, an, an avid hardcore fan of celebrity or reality TV shows in general, you know, all the names you follow them all you keep up with the after shows you follow the podcast you watch the youtube watch alongs like that would be something i'd want to like shoot myself in the brain continuously if that was me i wouldn't know how to live with myself that's why i'm happy i have um hobbies outside of it that kind of take away um from that being one of my interests because god damn it man i couldn't look myself in the mirror if that was me i really couldn't i have a hard time you know um understanding or accepting that that's a thing now imagine if that was an actual interest i would be d-e-a-d d-e-a-d but yeah what can you do um what else to talk about oh okay let's move on m lots of things to talk about lots of things to get into of course so grab yourself a little beverage if you've got one and let's dive in okay and we're back okay cool sorry about that some technical difficulties there had to restart my computer but we should be back and ready to go and you shouldn't have noticed any interruption if you're listening or watching the show everything will be pieced together and made to look whole anyway so jumping right back into it we have this story here courtesy of sky news where basically they have revealed and somehow um you know been privy to information pertaining to the roadmap that is going to lead us out of this hellhole that we've been stuck in for the last 11 months so so the following revealed white house plan for rapid reopening of shops pubs and restaurants it says here internal plans in white house suggest a rapid reopening of the economy in the weeks after pupils return to classrooms on the 8th of march sky news understands white house officials have drawn up a timetable to help work out the internal plans to roll out the government's planned mass covid testing regime this suggests a desire to reopen rapidly in the weeks after schools remit um most children next month which is completely understandable again it once the children go back in it's going to be pretty hard to justify to the populace that we should be locked in for a prolonged period of time in our homes when all these kids are running around sneezing on each other being with each other in the classroom all that other stuff you know we need to be outside it continues the blueprint suggests that the students in higher education forever education could be back in mid-april and non-central shops will reopen in the same time then in late april hospitality venues um hotels leisure centers and um some sporting venues will open their doors now this is concerning for porn white because obviously hospitality is one of my um interests and obviously i want to go back to leisure centers and go to gyms if, um them opening on april um sad concerning but at least it's a date again i'm i would much rather be able to go to the gym in march but i know that's probably not going to be possible if if you know at a stretch maybe the end of march um but that's not going to be likely considering the amount of attention and uh eyes and, and concern there will be about the schools reopening so quick quote unquote soon in march they're going to want to make sure they just get that right and alleviate any fears and then slowly reopen stuff you know the last thing you need is the populace kind of blaming you for um murdering their grand especially so close um to the whole population being vaccinated or the majority don't be vaccinated there's no need to fumble the bag at this point but again just the fact that we have a date just the fact that we have something to look forward to is so important i mentioned in the other podcast obviously the prison analogy i'm not sure if it's correct i'm not sure if it makes any sense but the whole premise behind it is that you know we never had any date we never had an idea of what we were kind of aiming for which probably um um didn't really help everyone's resolve in terms of abiding by the rules it might explain a lot of these um raves that are happening in places and uh, par uh parties and pubs behind closed doors and celebrities willing to get fined and shamed and have people fired off the back of them hosting an event like loads of st stuff that didn't really make any sense was occurring because people just were so desperate to congregate and just have some semblance of normality um for a brief period of time even if they knew in the back of their head they were most likely going to get caught and probably fined um 
I feel like, you know, that's why maybe that zero COVID plan they had um, in the Oceanics in Australia and New Zealand worked really well because there was obviously a um, a plan in place uh, with some dates and some numbers they needed to hit, which collectively probably inspired people, um, you know, to partake in some sort of um, civil responsibility, look after their neighbours for the greater good, um, you know, do away with their own needs and wants for the greater good, all that malarkey but I think it didn't really work that way in the UK again it could be a leadership thing because it's Boris and it's notorious people were never going to listen anyway and they kind of you know were already um have their they sort of had their backs up especially when you consider um you know uh the no deal Brexit agreements was happening at the same time I don't know loads of stuff occurred but I'm really optimistic that the fact that we're going to have dates is going to really um, alleviate a lot of people's fears um, a lot of people's issues that they're going through especially during this crazy time where we're in and it's just going to give people a little bit more calm and rest by i guess in terms of kind of being it kind of do away with some of the anxiety of, of the future when you know there's a, a a plan something to look forward to i'd imagine so i don't know it's just hope it says yeah but one of those individual uh, involved sorry in the lockdown and um, lifting working going on the government said that there would be a moment all the work went into the black box for number 10 to consider and then anything else would be possible this is however what officials were expecting just a few days ago there's been little evidence in the public data that will this week to suggest a more cautious approach than expected um to be uh, needed on monday when prime minister Boris Johnson due to sell the roadmap for easing the coronavirus restrictions um dominic so Dominic uh, Downing Street will will say no decision has yet been made the roadmap out of lockdown cannot be completed until the prime minister has considered the findings of the vast public health england study on the impact of covid vaccine investigation in, infection rate sorry only once he knows that he can determine how safely it can be to reopen the economy during a visit to the mass vaccination center on wednesday uh, mr johnson noted how hospitality was one of the last sectors to reopen last year after the first lockdown i know there's a lot of understandable speculation in the papers and people coming up with theories but what we're trying to do and what we're going to say about the rates of infection and so on he said so yeah the hospitality thing is an interesting one isn't it because so far from what i've read especially from the findings of last year hospitality was probably one of the lowest um proponents of spreading the virus in the first place right i think only five percent of cases stem from those from those establishments which makes sense considering most um places that i saw every you know person that worked in there was marked up there was a prospect screen in front of the bar um you couldn't you had to uh, basically order the, the drinks at, at at your table or you'd kind of get them pushed through a hole behind the perspect glass one in one out no standing only sitting down loads of things in place people you know cleaning all around the clock every 20 minutes and shit or whatever maybe um contract tracing it really limited the um it really kind of reduced um the need for that virus to spread in those kind of establishments but again who knows man for safety first that probably makes any sense going forward hopefully this all works out that's what we want to see so what did i watch i watched hyper yeah this is what i watched in a year i watched hyper normalization the other day finally finished it six hours plus full of content as you can see all my bars here are pink from the bbc player account and i've got to be honest man quite possibly maybe um adam curtis's best work so far um probably because it resonates with the times that we're living in at the moment he has a tendency of putting out these documentaries just when we need to see them um and the way they're obviously constructed the references that he pulls um and again like i think a lot of people maybe maybe it's charlie brooker's more so the bleak one but i always kind of feel quietly optimistic about um you know um adam curtis's documentaries and i think can't get it on my head was another one it kind of basically told me or told me the lesson to take away from this was that although there's loads of things that have been put in place in days gone by in order to try and control and manipulate our emotions and how we look and view the world we are quite um autonomous we have kind of a way of thinking on our own that's pretty much individualistic but if we are able to kind of garner our, our kind of individual um dreams wants and desires into some sort of collective action we can eventually change the world for the better for ourselves and for our children and for our family and for generations to come and um especially when you consider the amount of confusion that's going on out there in the political realm 
it really did resonate with me i have to be completely honest like it really did touch me um, a great deal maybe you kind of reflect a lot on how i kind of interact with media how i interact with social media the internet um and also it kind of made me feel oddly enough that once the what like i had this very prior but I'm, I'm kind of reiterating it again i'm kind of leaning more so on the idea that once the world does go back to normal i have a feeling that people are going to have a um something akin to the big disconnect where they're going to purposely pull away from posting a lot on social media or documenting every i'm sure the first couple of weeks will be a celebration of like oh, i can't believe it. it's been a while since i've not done this x y and z but by and large i think a lot more people are gonna purposely pull away and unplug from posting and broadcasting everything they do just so that they can absorb and kind of feel every moment that they're living in the quasi real world which obviously is the real world you know what i mean but i think prior to this virus there was this weird idea that people were kind of willing to accept where we were kind of going to live in this augmented virtual reality sort of world where we didn't need to actually meet people in real life we could do everything virtually we could do everything virtually through the internet um standing desk turn treadmills under your flipping desk to keep you working just cr just crazy crazy shit right in the in the kind of guise of optimizing us and um, in turning us into these uh killers at work by essentially kind of uh taking us away from being social creatures that we are where we want to touch and connect and people and how many times through the last weeks or so have i seen different accounts especially of parents who have been talking about the difficulties they're finding you know with you know um, homeschooling their children or just keeping them occupied during this time of lockdown when they were not able to go outside and play in the park and whatever it may be and a lot of them have basically been saying they just want to hug people they just want to go to the pub and just stand next to strangers um you know hug strangers sorry um, um hug family members kiss strangers whatever it may be but there's a lot of um i'm hearing a lot of a lot there's i'm hearing a strong desire for people to be tactile you know to put flesh to flesh lips to lips saliva to saliva fluid to fluid there's a lot of that going on in the moment and i think people really want to kind of feel the breeze and the sun hitting their skin as they sunbathe on a beach somewhere all of these things are, are things that you can't these sort of sensory um feelings that you get you can't necessarily get them via the internet um there are things that you can only feel once you're actually in the location that you want to go to um in real life and i think that's what basically um this documentary taught me and the takeaway that i got from it is that once the real world does reopen and go back to normal i'm going to go about um navigating it in the way that i have done in the past anyway to be honest i'm not the kind of person that does broadcast my every move there was a period in my life prior where I did kind of use my social media platforms as a way to kind of catalog and archive all my goings on. I've still got a USB, sorry, a external drive here where I've got essentially four of images and pictures from, you know, days gone by when I was uploading a, a gazillion pictures on Instagram and all that stupidness. But that time is kind of now past and I'm now a little bit more, you know, private with how I kind of interact with stuff. And just in general, I kind of love really kind of connecting and grounding myself in the location that i'm in i tend to kind of always subscribe to the idea of like going to going to a place like a location whether it be on holiday or just for a run um enjoying where i'm at taking loads of pictures chilling out talking to locals doing what i need to do and then once i return home then uploading all the images later i don't like this idea of like sort of like constantly documenting and kind of going out and seeking stuff so you can upload and share with people i kind of feel like it's good to kind of enjoy those things privately on your own and then later on if you want to show or kind of showcase where you've been you can kind of then upload that onto your social media platforms later and i've done that quite often other times i've kind of gone especially when i've gone to places like berlin where essentially i'm just going to club and I'm going to, you know, do a little uh, techno tourism, then usually what I tend to do is the first day or two, I tend to just go completely sober and just go out and just kind of ground myself in the nightlife, um, acclimatize myself in my surroundings and just kind of feel where I'm at so I can so i have something i can anchor my memories and my emotions and my feelings to once i head back home and then i'm kind of like replaying back the the the, the trip that i had and what i liked and what i didn't like i feel like sometimes when people i guess it's different when you go with your friends but when people are like you know you go with some friends and they're drinking on the way to the airport they're drinking on the flipping plane they land they watch the shower they go out to the bar you just you're just too turn up 
um to really enjoy yourself and you know um the older you get maybe that kind of changes as well you become a little bit more mature a little bit more savvy with how you go out and interact with the world and whatever it may be so if it's just an age thing who knows but i have felt this burning desire especially now more so now with the life that we're living at the moment to really double down on that approach of how i kind of navigate the world and how i kind of do holidays and do trips and and just basically hang out in it because that's what people are going to do but I'm, I'm assuming we won't be able to go on proper holidays until what maybe august september onwards still this year don't get me wrong but just the idea of being able to just go outside and hang out and do the things that we did previously i think it would probably serve you best to kind of put your phone in your pocket and just really enjoy it um for what it is you know ground yourself in it feel it for what it is um hear every little nook and cranny like there were times where especially when i'd go on my own to certain places i'd purposely leave my headphones at home so i could hear everything right the traffic noises the dogs barking kids playing in the park whatever it may be i want to i want to remember i want to feel everything that's going on i just don't want to i just don't want to turn it into a thing where you're just waking up and going from point a to point point b because i think we've especially with work now most of us are doing work at home um working remotely you've basically seen this whole idea of just going from point a to point b entering this rat race isn't very fulfilling the fulfilling part of it is you know because that's what probably that's what's probably going to make working at home a game changer right we're going to be able to work from home and we're also going to be able to enjoy our kind of free time there's not going to be a need for us you know the worst thing sometimes is if you worked at a place where essentially you're required to travel more than an hour or more than 45 minutes to go to your location which you're essentially then using up at least an hour and 30 minutes each way um when you kind of account for your waking up showering getting ready and also you account for your you know uh closing down getting your bags all this stuff traversing to the station you're wasting on average maybe f wasting you're kind of having to um take away three hours you know from your day um, just for commuting right and that then kind of really eats into your time for meeting your friends hanging out with your family um, doing your hobbies and your curricular activities but with the working from home what you then end up having is that because you're at home you haven't traveled to the office it allows more free time so if you end at five you can end at five and go straight out and be out with your friends by like half five or six p.m pretty nice right you don't have to it doesn't have to be like seven p.m or eight p.m going forward so i think with that it's kind of um on us to enjoy those little breaks in between to enjoy those little bits those little moments that we have that lunch break why not go for a walk why not go to a cafe around the corner that's in your area why not go for a fry up in the morning you know i mean these little odd things that we probably wouldn't have done you should maybe take advantage of it because as we've seen you know with the life that we're living at the moment nothing really is guaranteed um especially considering um <laughs> this came out of nowhere and kind of grounded us down but yeah i recommend you check it out man adam curtis i can't get out of my head really really great documentary um obviously maybe not up there with hyper normalization i think that was the one that kind of brought adam curtis to everyone's public consciousness but if you're a british person you probably are aware of adam curtis you know he makes documentaries for the bbc he's a pretty um he's a pretty household name he's a pretty household name in the uk but i think a lot of people in the, even the states are fairly familiar with his work but definitely check it out it's really really amazing You'll be able to find it on youtube I'm, I'm pretty sure he uploaded it to his youtube channel as well adam curtis documentaries check that out on youtube but it's called can't get armor Hey, that's really cool check it out if you can okay next on this what else do we have here oh yeah this is funny so this is courtesy of uh what's his account lewis rossman um this guy basically filmed himself uh cycling the streets of new york uh during the lockdown of course and he's kind of aghast and really taken aback by some of the approaches to outdoor dining obviously cuomo has you know basically um prevented restaurants and bars and stuff from serving people indoors obviously with the threat of the virus and um, there's this idea if they you're indoors with no ventilation the virus is going to spread easier so you have to kind of adopt the outdoor dining idea and you know if you've ever been to paris and places you'll know that you know these places are very big on the idea of people sitting essentially right on the curb with little to no room for people to walk and sort of people watching it's a thing that they always do but they're fairly um you know basic um setups right it's essentially like a little canapé that kind of pops out of the shop with some chairs underneath 
um, and kind of keeping you away from the elements. But it's not necessarily a building. It's just literally an awning that they just place out with some chairs that go underneath it, usually closely stacked together with a little rigidy table that you have to kind of put your foot at the base so it doesn't wobble too much. But what they've done in the States looks a little bit questionable, a little bit suspect, because what it appears like they've done in order to get around the outdoor dining thing is essentially built little gazebos, uh, little extensions outside of their restaurants that really make you think they're more they're more so indoor buildings than there are outdoor buildings. But let's say, let's see what he's doing anyway. This a here's a video. Okay, I give this outdoor dining some credit. See this here, this is outdoor dining that it's indoors but with a door. But with that it's open. So the door is open. So at the very least this outdoor dining hut is approximately a similar level of safety to a restaurant that has its door open. I've given up on a lot of trying to understand New York. <laughs> I've lived here for 32 years. Skip forward. Skip forward a little bit. Or make me sad or depressed or... So, I try to avoid on trying to understand it. I just exist within it, you know? I go with the flow. <laughs> I exist within it. But I will not lose my mind trying to understand it. God. Oh God. Hey, look at Is this. that really? <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> you built a fucking house exactly. outside of your restaurant. Yo. That is a fucking house. What the fuck? Okay, they have the door open. They have the door open, okay. But what is the difference? What the fuck is the difference between this? This is the funniest a bit here. Where you open the fucking door. Look! It is a door! <laughs> it is a door! <laughs> there are no doorknobs when you're outside! And it's interesting, isn't it? Because I guess this is just a... Um, a consequence of draconian laws and restaurants basically trying to stay alive and trying to stay afloat and make sure that they're kind of covering exorbitant rates of rent in new york and you know paying for a mortgage on a home um you know paying for a school that the kids can't attend there's loads of things that are basically at play here that result in these sort of weird little huts being built on the side of the street and if you know if you're familiar with going to new york the sidewalks are pretty big but, you know, they're not big enough to kind of accommodate every single restaurant having an extra house built on the outside of their buildings. The interesting thing that's going to happen is that I'm sure this is like a temporary license because, you know, I'm sure the licensing um, uh, laws in New York are pretty strict and limit people from what they can kind of build and what they can't build. So I'm interested to see what happens when kind of the laws and the restrictions get loosened somewhat because I'm sure that these restaurants would be willing to kind of keep these places up because they're essentially providing them with extra cover, right? Extra tables that they can make some money on when you don't include the things that are going to be indoors. And especially if you consider there might be a little bit of, um, what would you call it? There might be a little bit more, there might be a little bit of trepidation from a lot of customers coming in initially once the lockdown do, do kind of loosen where they will kind of want to be safe quote unquote and keep sitting outdoors right quote unquote so um those tables will probably end up being the prized tables to basically get oddly enough which just sounds strange don't get me wrong but I, I can imagine that being a thing especially for the first couple of months after lockdown get restricted and as soon as it gets restricted and people feel a bit more comfortable with the new normal that we're living in they'll just go straight back to norm, straight back to what they were doing prior but it's quite insane isn't it that these they've built these essentially huts outside of their <laughs> restaurant um that essentially just look like homes and look like regular buildings a blight obviously not built to spec and you know maybe not insulated and whatever it may be but uh, they're not going to prevent you from not getting the virus if somebody in there has the virus and they sneeze whilst they're not wearing their mask because they're eating you're going to catch that shit there's no way you're not going to catch that shit but again you know uh, i don't blame them for trying to keep the lights on and it's a tough world we're living at the moment it's a tough world we're living at the moment next on the list to talk about next on the list we have um a pretty core cool 
an interesting series I watched on Showtime. Just finished it. The first season is called Your Honor. It stars the dude who plays Walter White in Breaking Bad. Visit name Michael Cranston, whatever his surname is or first name is. Brian Cranston, sorry. I got his name wrong. Um, and it's an incredible TV series, right? Incredible more so because of the emotions it elicits um this dude here this little kid adam um brian cranston's son uh basically in the series is quite possibly one of the most frustrating and annoying characters that i've ever seen in my entire life um i think obviously it's either going to be a consequence of really great writing or maybe amazing acting or maybe terrible writing right it could just be one of those things as well you know sort of similar to like the second and third season of power when stuff started to get a little bit loopy um it wasn't necessarily a consequence of good writing more so because the writers that were great left and then they tried to kind of figure stuff out in between and end up being shit but regardless of course okay if you're watching this as well make sure this is a spoiler alert because i'm going to talk about you know obviously stuff that occurred in this series if you don't want to hear it please skip ahead so um the kid is annoying right because he already of course as the kind of plot of the of the series goes uh brian Car brian cranston's character is a well-liked and well-regarded judge in new orleans who's very i'd say woke or a kind of con kind of aware of the racial biases that exist and uh you know um the corrupt police force and the politics and blah 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 but he's quite empathetic right he starts off being this quasi saintly judge figure that everyone kind of loves and respects then his son gets involved in an accident where he inadvertently um kills runs over and kills the son of a very well-known mob boss who just moved into new orleans um to set up business and set up shop um in an attempt to keep the boy alive the kid inadvertently ends up killing this the boy that he ran over by sticking his fingers in his in his mouth and then throughout the entire series um this saintly judge who everyone kind of heralds as like a martyr not as much as someone heralds as somebody to kind of look up to um an honest guy um goes on his journey where he's kind of ferociously trying to protect his son from these mobsters who might find out that he was responsible for the death of their son and it's pretty good because you get to see somebody you know quite just quite honorable uh get corrupted through uh trying to basically protect their children and then maybe it's a kind of um insight into how people are complex right there's this idea now in society where everyone's kind of black and white you're either good or you're bad but usually we're a makeup of two we can have our bad days we can have our good days and i think what this kind of reveals especially to the judge is that he could quite easily have ended up being on the other side of the docky other side of the courtroom if he would have took a couple of wrong decisions here and there that's all it takes it's not very um far-fetched for people to get involved in that life of crime of debauchery of sad is of sadism whatever it may be right you you can end up there pretty quickly if you end up kind of down on your luck and you kind of go in different ways especially when you consider his character in the movie um the, the, his wife kind of passed away i think she got murdered i think in a series but it's kind of unsolved who actually did it so he's obviously suffering from some loss but he's still able as a single father to kind of hold it together and raise his son pretty well uh prior to the, the obviously accident but of course the kid is super annoying and frustrating because quite similar to like um junior in sopranos he's unaware of what his reality actually is and he kind of still thinks he's a, a kind of normal teenage kid and you know he obviously gets involved in a very tragic accident with that's involving some very serious people and instead of doing everything he can to lay low um, listen to his father in terms of directions he does everything out in his power to basically um, atone for his mistakes by acting out and telling everybody i think even both no one of his girlfriends um you know his godfather loads of other people about who actually ended up killing the person in the first place and at every turn whenever brian cranston's character is sort of getting things together and kind of working out a plan to get out of this and maybe get them free from the shackles of this mob boss this kid goes around and does something completely stupid again and it's just so annoying and i have to be honest it was so gratifying to finally see him on the final episode get killed inadvertently of course because i think the kid um whose uh, brother ended up uh that kind of taking the bullet for the murder 
goes to shoot um the other guy who's then you know the other son of the mob boss and uh the gun goes off wrong and ends up killing um adam that's there on the right and i have to be honest with you, it was very satisfying it really was i watched it and i was like oh that was really really good i was really happy that the more annoyed because it happens quite often these series where i guess it's a great retention tactic you write in these really um grating cringy annoying characters that people complain about on social media and then the more they complain about them the more it means that they're engaged with the show so you just keep writing them in again season in season out with no real um indication of when they're ever going to get phased out of the stories and people kind of keep tuning in hoping that something really bad happens to them and that's why i ended up doing all the way through to the last episode so it worked in a genius move but I recommend you check it out. It's a really, really good um, uh, TV series. They somehow managed to work in a bit of COVID in there, um, which was uh, interesting to see. Uh, but I think overall, it's not, it's not the most sophisticated thing in the world. Don't get me wrong. Um, it's mostly carried by Brian Cranston's amazing acting. But overall, and obviously the, the mob boss as well, whoever plays uh, the mob boss's dad, he's an amazing, amazing actor. This guy here in the middle. Um, I, I don't know what his name is, but he's really, really good in it as well. Um, I really recommend you check out. Let's actually see what his actual name is here. Where's the cast? Uh, that's his name, Michael Stolberg. He's absolutely awesome in it, right? Um, this guy, Tommy Baxter amazing in it really 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 good man um he's in a lot of stuff in it obviously you see call me by oh yeah he's a dad in call me by your name in it true he's in boardwalk empire as well yeah very very true a serious man okay i didn't know that okay cool but yeah check it out man it's really really amazing tv series called your honor um again easily one of my favorite shows that i've watched in recent times um gripping television from begin to the end i think it's gonna have a second season i'm pretty sure from what i've heard and read online um this girl is really cool, isn't it, as well? She's really, really good. I really recommend you check it out. Really, really fun. Really, really fun. Okay, moving on. What else do we have here? Let's go on. <clears throat> this is courtesy of Bloody Elbow. Um, news coming from Joe Rogan, who basically declared on his podcast that he will not be taking the vaccine. He's going to do everything he can in his power to make sure he doesn't take that damn vaccine in order to get rid of that damn virus because he doesn't need it and he's a fit and healthy man so the headline says the following joe rogan will take covid 19 vaccine i would if i felt like i needed it he says so the story continues it says joe rogan the host of popular joe rogan experience podcast has no intention of taking the coronavirus vaccine when it becomes available to him during a recent episode with actor and comedian jamar neighbors rogan questioned the importance of the vaccine for health conscious individuals he said no when asked if he was taking the vaccine i mean if i would need felt like i needed it i just feel like if you maintain your health and i think for some people it's going to be important cool the interesting thing about it is that why do people care i guess we should all have our own individual choices we're allowed to kind of decide what we do with our bodies i think this idea that the government should mandate and force people to take their vaccine is absolutely insane obviously some of the crackpot conspiracy theories around it are also pretty much insane but people should be free um to choose if they want to do it for their family for themselves um and if they don't then it is what it may be they assume the responsibility and the risk and you just continue living your life and there's obviously that um that sort of um way of thinking that would suggest that if everyone else gets it then why does everyone else that doesn't want to get it need to get it because everyone else has been vaccinated do you know what i mean there's that kind of idea that goes behind it of course it's not scientific i'm just talking about my ass because i don't know jack shit and also he's a podcaster right he's allowed to have his opinion and his choice of what he wants to do um feel free and let him do what he wants the interesting and confusing part for me is that considering how you know he's much joe rogan lately has been a bit annoying with his ragging on la again and again ever since he moved to texas he's kind of taken it upon himself to keep kicking la as much as he can because obviously he left in a bit of a huff because he couldn't continue doing his stand-up and living his life because gavin newsom kind of you know um put the hammer on that state um by and large and really took the most extreme um and really strict measures concerning covid went back a few times obviously was called um you know when he told everyone to stay in he was obviously calling the restaurant himself um blah 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 loads of stuff that he basically did that was kind of you know incorrect and maybe a little bit scummy but joe's kind of gonna have his way to kind of kick him and continue keep saying you know that's part of the reason why he decided to up sticks and move his family to texas now the issue is is that 
you know, during this whole time, he's been doing shows, especially out in Texas with Dave Chappelle. They've been obviously making sure everyone's gotten tested prior to them and made sure they implemented all kind of safety procedures. But he's been very adamant about people returning back to normal and kind of, you know, him going back on stage and opening his own comedy club. So it's just interesting that somebody that's been pushing for COVID to just basically be over and be gone and things to open back up again is resistant to take the vaccine that's going to quickly spread speed that thing up and also in a weird way it would maybe provide people with um peace of mind when they're attending a show knowing that oh yeah the guy that i'm going to see got it themselves um there's probably something within that i'm not too sure i just find it a very interesting approach right these comedians are keep going on as if you know they're essential workers and what they're doing is incredibly vital which it obviously isn't um but it makes vital to them but not to the wider society i would argue and if the if that's the case and you actually do believe it why not do everything in your power to contribute to the world reopening so that you can get back on stage to the capacity you want to because no one wants to do social distance shows no one wants to do a show where you're separated from people with a perspect glass and you have to sit on your table and you can't move you have to like no one wants that people want to be in a tight um densely packed comedy club with loose um sorry with low ceilings you know drinking a whiskey spitting all over each other slapping the table you know sharing some drinks hugs and kisses that's what people actually want and if that's the case why don't you contribute to it by taking a vaccine as sort of uh, a symbolic gesture of hey we're gonna go back to normal things are gonna return to how they were before and i'm kind of committed to doing so here's why i took that jab even though i'm healthy because once you start doing because like, i don't know maybe it's just me but once you start talking all about that oh if i'm healthy and i'm fit and i'm able it kind of sounds like you're in that kind of covid denying um lane right you're kind of going in that kind of conspiracy theory lane where the virus doesn't really exist and it's only a way of kind of controlling us and getting us to kind of acquiesce and give away our civil liberties and our privacy and our rights and all this sort of stuff there is some truth to it don't get me wrong but you know look how far down the road we are now we have smartphones in our pockets that are always on monitoring everything that we do and now suddenly we're all willing to draw the line at a virus that's preventing us from living our every everyday lives let alone these you know social media companies taking our data and mining it to different places we don't even know what the value of it is we don't even know what our data holds you know what i mean it's absolutely insane but hey what do i know we continue on we continue on we continue on we continue on so this is courtesy of variety dave Chappelle um finally sorted out his beef with netflix and essentially got the money he was basically looking for and the show has now been put back on netflix the dave Chappelle show so if you're interested to watch it go ahead and check it out but the funny thing and the odd thing i thought about this whole issue has been dave's rollout and the way he's kind of approached and broached the topic of his dispute with viacom and you know having to show up on netflix and not being compensated for it from what i understand of the original story he signed a pretty shitty deal that he was aware of at the time um was maybe a terrible deal things changed things you know he ends up being who he is at the moment he has a lot of leverage that he could basically use in his um in his power in his to his advantage but essentially the crux of the issue is that the show was sold for x amount of money at a certain time the rights were obviously then given to the production company or the channel or the network that obviously bought it they could do with it what they please they then decide to you know slap it up onto onto netflix it's their profit to do so and then he also wanted to pay a piece of that and again then complaining to the public about that and kind of doing a woe is me stand-up act and kind of decrying that you're just a what would you call it a starving artist that's just trying to fight for your right to express your art when really in reality you're one of the world's you know highly paid comedians um widely regarded as maybe one of the best i'd say him and bill burr are one and two but hey it's up to you who you decide to go with it just seemed very odd and kind of out of touch and something that you wouldn't necessarily think or expect from a Dave Chappelle really. It was really kind of odd to see him go through this whole thing um, and present it as some sort of hero's journey that he was kind of coming back and showing us the Philosopher's Stone um that somehow you know him doing comedy and doing being on stage was fundamental to his entire existence and we had to go and see him had to put these shows on 
um, the fact that he got COVID, you know, due to his recklessness, um, going out, attending parties, um, you know, socializing and just doing shit he probably shouldn't have done, especially when you consider the scale of the event that he was putting on. And then he used that as opportunity as well to kind of say that, you know, the haters always want to see you lose. It's like, no, mate, you were just kind of fucking around and doing things you shouldn't have done. But anyway, let's continue. This is the article from Variety. It says, uh, Dave Chappelle's show is returning to Netflix on February 12th, the comedian has revealed. He also spoke about his dealings with Comedy Central, thanked Netflix chief Ted Sarandos for standing by him. At the end of the routine performed in Austin, uh, venue Stubbs titled Redemption Song, posted on Chappelle's Instagram page on Thursday, it is revealed that Dave Chappelle would be back on Netflix on February 12th. The show was removed um, from the streamer at his request on November, the tw November 2020, a comedian, uh, at the comedian's request. Um, the issue was that dispute around the contract that Chappelle had with the Comedy Central owner Viacom CBS, which he alleged allowed the company to license the series without his agreement and also prevented him from receiving royalties. Referring to that incident, Chappelle said an Instagram clip, I never asked Comedy Central for anything. If you remember, I said I'm going to be my a real boss, which is you, and I came to you, the audience, because I know where my power lies. I asked you to stop watching the show and I thank God Almighty for you, and you did. You made that show worthless because without you, your eyes, it's nothing and you stopped watching it they called me and I got my name back and I got my license back and I got my show back and they paid me millions of dollars and that's what kind of irked me the wrong way he basically leverages fame um, essentially mobilizes his fan base in order to get a network to acquiesce and bend the knee give him back his show made millions in the process on top of the whatever he's making with the sh with, with the live shows he's doing at the moment and then tried to turn the idea that he got COVID into some sort of um, again martyrdom that he kind of had to had to do these shows he couldn't not not do these shows and there was this this thing that made me think about the play graves and you know again these djs going and playing these events in places that they probably shouldn't be playing them because it's you know it's maybe not the most responsible thing to do um part of the reason why they're annoying is that most of them are just not honest with their intentions and just saying look hey I've got two kids. I've got an amazing mansion in the flipping in the middle of, you know, Brussels that I have to pay for. Um, or I just like being on stage and getting the attention. But regardless of the fact, just be honest with your intentions and say, hey, I want to do this. I'm doing this and it's what it is. But most of the time they turn around and kind of cite the numbers of COVID and the fact that things were COVID safe and all this sort of nonsense. When you know most of these people that are playing in these third world countries, uh, and these developing countries are very aware that they're essentially taking advantage of a government that is a bit lax um, and a little bit willing to take more risk with their populace in order to kind of attract a more international community or com international audience, let's say. Um, so to suggest that, you know, going to play these gigs is anything but a selfish desire, which we all have, and it's fine to go and kind of exercise really kind of grinds my game that's why i kind of see with this whole dave Chappelle thing um you did the shows because you wanted to do the shows that's why you ended up getting covid because you did the shows and you were being reckless um the deal you signed a bad deal and things changed you know they wanted to go put it on netflix uh, i didn't really see why it then became an issue that we had to be bothered about or pay any attention to or offer or extend any sort of sympathy for it just didn't make any sense it continues here it says this very moment Chappelle continued I want to thank Ted Taranis on Netflix the CEO with his courage to take my show off the platform at financial detriment to his company just because I asked him and I want to thank Chris McCarthy of CBS of Viacom this guy's younger than me and like most people younger than me has an intense um, has an interest in making the past right and did something that a very was very courageous and finally after all three years after these years sorry I can finally say that Comedy Central it's been a pleasure doing business with you the comedian also addressed his recent battle with coronavirus he said there are faction of people the cowards he said <laughs> he's so noble right he's so brave going out there and fighting the stand-up dragon uh, we said um the faction of people there that are cowards who said you see dave Chappelle, that's why you stay inside and that's when it's just that's where it's safe and we never do it try anything which is just insane to say that um well enjoy yourselves motherfuckers because i'm better now Chappelle said earlier just in the gen 6 insurrection because Chappelle did it you know but yeah that's basically the crux of it um interesting statements again um i'm not going to judge it too much because again I, I think people are going through whatever they're going through through this lockdown it's probably doing odd things to people's heads i can just imagine being a you know world touring world-renowned 
stand-up comedian who basically lives for the stage lives to be on the road it can be quite debilitating to have that taken away from you it's essentially part of your you know makeup that's been basically ripped um from your insides but we're all kind of going through the same thing we're all suffering in our own little way it's just i think in order to have understanding and and for us to have any sort of empathy for these people um celebrities i mean they just need to be honest with their intentions and say look i just need this like you guys need to breathe this is my thing i can't help but not be on stage and i'm gonna find whatever route i can legal or illegal to put these shows on i'm just gonna let you know they're in public and people just continue and no everyone will be fine no one will really care but it's this idea that it's just this noble pursuit that they're out to help the little man and they're this strappy there's this kind of starving artist that's just scraping to rub two pennies together it's like come on you're De Chappelle mate we know what you do we know what you do moving on oh this is a bit of a sad story in it obviously this is a bit of an update concerning Morgan Wallen the country singer do you remember as I reported in the last episode of the podcast uh, about an incident how he got himself in where he was coming back from a night out of his friends um, he got dropped off at his home by his friend and in the midst of him leaving his friend's car and going to his front door he decided to refer to his very Caucasian friend as the n-word which of course you know is a neoliberalism and then um, some handy neighbor who happened to be recording it through his phone zoomed in recorded the entire interview interaction obviously naturally sent it to tmz and which then followed a whole avalanche of cancellations from radio stations to production to record labels to representation just all over the shop people just decided to go na 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 and at the time as i said i think it's quite clear that this guy is a little bit of a dum-dum he probably doesn't you know he's probably not the smartest guy in the room uh not the sharpest knife in the toolbox or whatever that saying is and i'm probably demonstrating how dumb i am by not getting this analogy right but regardless it doesn't necessarily strike me as the most intelligent man in the world i don't think what he said came from a malicious place but it was still way way crazy to hear somebody refer to their very caucasian friend as the n-word as a departing sort of um joke or sign of affection as he's leaving his home it just sounded very odd and he sounded way too comfortable saying it and considering the connotations of the south with racism and of course country music itself being very segregated and how you know differently they treat people who aren't necessarily you know white or blonde hair right it just seemed very odd and then you couple it up with his previous cancellation thing or episode that he went through where he was caught you know um gallivanting around a party prior to him going on snl obviously breaking his covid protocol rules that he had prior to going on the show him you know recorded the video of some person recorded a video on tiktok and record and uploaded it of him basically smooching random girls you know if he's single it doesn't really matter but in general the optics weren't that great he took a step back and then he got booked in another show but in general putting those things together it just seems like he's not the most sensible and mature guy that exists out there and i think dropping a hard end bomb to you know uh, describe or to kind of show affection to your friend who isn't black and even if the worst person was black i'd really be questioning why he'd allow somebody that's caucasian to say that to him as a sign of affection because it makes no sense especially when the guy looks like that right and he's not really about this life it doesn't really make any sense so anyway he decided to put out an apology video to kind of explaining his side of things and we're gonna check it out now and see what he has to say hey y'all it's morgan I'm long overdue to make a statement regarding my last incident. <laughs> I wanted to collect my thoughts, seek some real guidance, I'm sorry. and come to you with a complete thought before I did. I was made aware of the video being posted to TMZ with hardly any time to think before it was released to the public. I was asked if I wanted to apologize, and of course I did. I wrote many detailed thoughts, and only a portion of those got used, which painted me in an even more careless light. Uh, I'm here to. Ho I'm here to hopefully show you that that's not the truth. Uh, the video you saw was, was me on our 72 of 72 of a bender. And that's not something I'm proud of either. Obviously, the, the natural thing to do is to apologize further and just continue to apologize, but because you got caught. And that's not what I wanted to do. That's what you're doing, um, though. I let so many people down. 
and who mean a lot to me and who have given so much to me and it's just not fair. And I let my parents down and they're the furthest thing from the people, from the person in that video. Uh, I let my son down and I'm not okay with that. So this week I've been waiting to say anything further until I got the chance to apologize to those closest to me that I knew I personally hurt. Uh, I also accepted some invitations from some amazing black organizations. <laughs> of course. And, and the Black Apology Tour. Some, some very real and honest conversations. Uh, I'll admit to you, I was pretty nervous to accept those those invitations. Um, the very people I hurt, and they had every right to, to step on my neck while I was down to to be to not show me any grace, but they did the exact opposite. I think I've mentioned it prior. My my obviously view on cancel culture is that I am not a fan of it whatsoever. I think you should be free to say whatever you want. I'm a free speech absolutist in that regard, but you should also be willing to accept whatever consequences that come with what you say. Um, I think way too often people get, you know, um, hung up on the idea of free speech, but then as soon as something doesn't go the way that they kind of anticipated it, they all suddenly start freaking out. Oh, and start making up excuses. No, if you want to say what you want to say, you are allowed to, but then you also have to accept that whatever reaction comes from what you say, is the nature of the beast if that's a punch in the face if that's a demotion if that's a you know um uh suspension from social media platforms whatever it may be you have to accept and just take it on the chin this whole crying and whining in public about it just seems really odd now the issue i have with this whole thing there are levels to stuff that you say and it just seemed very odd that this was something that he would just say as a thing just because he wanted to say it, especially in America, especially in the South, especially during this time in history, considering the racial tensions that were occurring post the George Floyd death, regardless of how you think he died, regardless of the, the, um, the importance or the validity you put on the Black Lives Matter movement, regardless of what's going on, it just seemed like such a brain dead thing to do and such a shot in his own foot that didn't really make any sense. It was really, really unnecessary. And I guess part of me thinks, okay, cool, maybe he was just drunk and he just got drunk and he thought, you know what, we just drop an M-bomb because we want to do what you want to do. But unfortunately, being the level of celebrity he is at the moment, he just can't afford to do that. And considering the prior mistakes he's done in the past and people have been leaking stories about him being a douche here, a douche there, which I don't really care about. Those are all anecdotal. It is what it is. Um, people are allowed to be a douche in private if they need to be. It doesn't mean they have to kind of lose their job off the back of it. But dropping a hard end bomb with your friends that aren't black as a way to what? show affection or anything is bizarre he was super unlucky first of all because the person recorded him right somebody obviously it seemed like was having some sort of beef with him or was looking for him to slip up or just record him and just see if they could catch anything that they could sell and they happened to just you know stumble upon an absolute golden nugget of him dropping in the emblem and then they probably got paid a handsome amount of money from those you know trash um, news sites like tmz and whatever it may be so maybe he was just generally unlucky but again the, you just have to question the intelligence and the comprehension of somebody that would be happy to say that kind of stuff outside in the open of his car, knowing full well his profile and knowing full well you're living in a sort of, again, he wasn't like he's living in a in a high rise building somewhere in the middle of, you know, on the side of Miami Beach. He was in a wild sort of from the video, sort of like a residential street, you know, with houses kind of packed in around each other. It's fairly easy to hear somebody coming in at the dead of night when no other cars are moving around. You could probably hear loads of conversations from afar. So just to say that out loud just seemed like such an idiotic thing to do. They offered me grace and they, they also paired that with an offer to learn and to grow. And I'll be honest, you know, that kindness uh, really inspired me to to dig deeper. I don't know how to do something <laughs> about this. The one thing I've learned already is I'm specifically sorry for is that it matters. My words matter. A word can truly hurt a person. And at my Imagine core, being a I'm singer and only realizing that now. This week I heard firsthand some personal stories from black people that honestly shook me. And I know what I'm going through this week doesn't even compare to some of the trials I heard about from them. I came away from those discussions with a deep appreciation for them and a clearer understanding of the weight of my words. 
I wish the circumstances were different for me to learn these things, but I'm also glad it started the process for me to do so. I've got many more things to learn, but I already know that I don't want to add to any division. This week was a big lesson that sometimes we can do just that without even knowing it. Our actions matter, our words matter, and I just want to encourage anyone watching to please learn from my mistakes. There's no reason to downplay what I did. It matters, and please know I'm carefully choosing my next steps in repair. We hope you are, mate. I want to end this update. Hopefully, don't insult the Jews, because that'll be over for uh, you. Since that video was taken, I've been sober for nine days. <laughs> it's not all that long of a time, but it's enough to know the man <sighs> in that video is not the man that I'm trying to be. Man, Americans are so odd, isn't it? Usually, when you get really fucked up, I don't know. You hook up with somebody you're not meant to hook up with. You get into a street fight. But why is it whenever these people, especially people in the states, um, get drunk or you know get high or get too excited they just drop m-bombs what is it about these guys like what is it about i guess it's a good i guess in just um you know basic you know understanding of it it's probably done because it's an easy trigger point they know it's something you're not meant to say it's taboo so just saying it is super naughty you know you're being a bit edgy um but it's just so odd that that seems to be the kind of go-to thing like it's kind of akin to like um, farting, isn't it, right? That farting sort of humour with you and your friends. It's like after a while, it just, you know, it's just like, uh, is it really that funny or, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, I don't know, man. I find this absolutely hilarious. But I guess the, the good thing for him, especially with NME, is that now his album is on number two. Number two, sorry. Number one album for two weeks after his racial slur video which i'm not too sure if that's a, a bad indictment on america or if it's just a good indication that cancel culture is sort of coming to an end because this is my ideal solution my ideal solution would be not for the corporations to cancel you or the platforms because i wasn't a fan of that at all he's been blackballed by the entire industry basically excommunicated he's off radio playlist um he's labeled as representative anymore management dropped him all this sort of stuff i think is way overboard i think what should end up happening really and truly your label should stick with you if they want to if no your label should stick with you and your management sponsors and stuff are free to do what they want they have other things that they sort of need to concern themselves with but it should be up to the actual listeners to decide whether or not they like you or not right and whether or not they want to back you and whether or not they kind of want to forgive you and accept what you've done um and sort of move on if that's the case cool then you're more than willing to have a career but that should be where it ends so i think sometimes when i see these videos they kind of make me feel like instead of him just being happy that he has fans that are willing to put his album at number one for two weeks he's still trying to maneuver and get back his position in the kind of mainstream and i sometimes think some mistakes are just grave enough for you just to kind of forfeit your right to have a normal career you can still have a good one that's the thing with the internet you can still have an amazing one you can still have a dedicated fan base go on tour but the days of him being able to go on you know saturday morning tv shows and shit are probably going to be over right you would imagine so the the, the 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 prospect of him performing at the grammys are probably over you know the country music awards all this sort of stuff you sort of forfeit the right to do that you can still again you can still have a career but again i just sometimes i think those um, videos can be a little bit manipulative but let's read this well the article here said disgraced country star morgan wallam has secured a number one album from america for the fifth week running despite emergencies of the recent video which of him using rachel slur the country star has faced strong consequences since the clip surfaced with his label big loud dropping him radio stations and moving his music from the playlist despite his um he has maintained his strong chart position with the album and strong sales surging all the time um and his radio play and playlist inclusion continue to fall as consequence of some reports sales of the violence dangerous the double album are con continuing to increase with physical sales up by 49 percent since last week with a total of 37 thousand units sold in total 150,000 album units were shifted an increase at one percent from the week prior in contrast a huge decrease in airplay for one and at radio station across the united states as noted on february 3rd his music was played on 71 percent less than in 24 hours before jesus he was on a lot of radio playlists isn't it that's a lot of money off the table that's maddening the video that caused the uh, um the violin to be dropped was filmed by one of his neighbors and saw the musician saying take care of that pussy ass nigga <laughs> honestly imagine this guy saying that to you man honestly imagine saying just saying that out loud and thinking it's okay and it's chill like the the ease man the kind of ease that's the thing that's so so kind of um 
annoying isn't it about these sort of issues because uh, part of you kind of thinks like imagine if you just live in white skin for just a day how i must feel to navigate the world with very little consequences uh <laughs> befalling upon you especially if you become somebody of some sort of level of notoriety where you could just go around just dropping end bombs all over the place and still having a career that would be so great isn't it so great to live that sort of life um it continues um i used an unacceptable and inappropriate racial slur he said in apology statement there are no excuses to use this language ever and i want to sincerely apologize for using that word i promise to do better <laughs> i promise i won't call my white friends nigger anymore i promise he also told his fans not to defend him and claimed that he uttered the racial slur on a 72 hour bender yeah right um while in previously stoked controversy last year and he filmed break it da, da, da. but yeah hey he's okay he'll rescue his career again like i said cancel culture um can be annoying at times because you know i don't think it's any benefit to anybody for him to get completely removed from you know um normal co public consciousness i think the fans should be the ones that they decide that but sometimes you can say some stuff that's just so grave and so callous and so lacking in decency that you sort of forfeit your right to a normal entertainment life you kind of have to kind of you know um uh sit out sit this one out in terms of being a mainstream star that's what i'd say in that regard moving on of course our boy brendan shop had a pretty um nonsense take regarding the entire thing uh he had an opinion regarding how <laughs> things should go forward <laughs> for morgan well and gasson and issue let's hear what brendan shop had to say regarding it i'm very very curious to hear his opinion let's hear what he has to say did, 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 did. the homeless cats uploaded this video Let's see if I can get this up on here. Bear with me one second. So this is Brendan Schub's opinion on Morgan Wallen and he used the N-word sat between two black men. Let's see what his opinion on it is because that's what we want to hear, right? Another cancelled person, Morgan Wallen. Uh, he's not cancelled. I mean, for now. It's tough to cancel Morgan Wallen because for Johnson. saying the N-word, all the stations dropped him, but the his purchases on iTunes went through the roof. Well, wouldn't you want to, you know, uh leave the floor for your two black co-hosts who you pay to be your friends wouldn't you want to do that first concerning this issue hey what do you guys think of this issue and then maybe come up with your kind of controversial hot take second yeah like, interesting because because the world like again the people decide if you have a career or not so the people are like mm, yeah we he made a mistake he's a talented dude he learned from it we down we his music like went through the fucking roof down he learned from it it just happened the other day He's been sober for what eleven days, maybe total. Like, what is he talking about? <laughs> Downloads went through the roof. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. His fan base watches a lot of NASCAR, so him saying the N word. <laughs> I, I don't Basically. think he's a bad guy. I, you know, I don't know him personally. I know. <laughs> I don't think he's a bad guy. I don't know him personally. That's a classic short line, isn't it? I don't know him personally, but he's not a bad guy. Great guy. Never met him. Dio knows him. Um, I, you know, him saying that isn't going to make me stop listening to his music. Oh, great. Good to know. You know, the funny thing is about this, right? Part of me thinks, part of me thinks, right? The reason why, do you think I look a little bit like um, Chappelle with, with a beard? Maybe. It doesn't matter. But part of me thinks the reason why Brendan is like this is because he's afraid he's going to get cancelled. But I think he kind of overestimates his celebrity, I think, a little bit. Morgan Wallen's a pr by the looks of it, a pretty big and popular um, country music star. You only have to look at that video of him smooching those little young hotties at that party. They were all over him. He was the talk of the party. There were so many selfie images and videos of him at the at the uh, at the you know gathering. They were really excited to have him in their presence. So he's a big deal. People really care about him, right? The numbers on the Fear of Vaughn podcast that he did were absolutely insane. He seems like a pretty cool dude. You know, you'd probably love to crack a beer with him, but you know, you wouldn't want to maybe go on a 72 hour bender because then he would refer to you as a nigger. But part of me thinks the reason why Brendan Shop has these sort of opinions is because he feels that if ever he there's an occasion where he slips up and says something wrong or he's caught doing something he shouldn't be doing and he gets cancelled, he wants to be in a position where he can kind of rally his fan base to gather around him and support him. But I think he kind of overestimates his level of celebrity. Because of course this podcast, they get loads of numbers. Sometimes their numbers may be, you know, far outweigh the numbers that a network television show would get. But in general it's a pretty 
niche audience still it's big it's very act it's very kind of loyal and kind of um uh you know they're yeah they're loyal they're driven they want to support everything that he does from his merch to his shows blah 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 but in terms of the wider context right if something were to happen obviously you don't want it to happen right god forbid that touch wood it would be pretty difficult for him to come back and have a normal career they did before it would be pretty difficult and considering the empire that he's built now that's so reliant on him having the ability to do the show and do the stand-up and everything it would probably fall away pretty quickly if he did end up getting into a situation that would cause him to get cancelled so that might explain why he's so quick to jump out and defend this because he wants it to be known that the fans are the ones that are holding him down to got his position when in fact he's also the guy that's known for not reading comments and not listening to suggestions that come in from the fans and basically kind of acting like he's a bit above it and smarter than everybody and he doesn't need any direction but now he's obviously saying the fans are fans are fans it's really funny and again it's also funny that he's the first to kind of jump out the window and have an opinion on this topic even though he's got two black dudes sitting next to him and he's also the one to categorically kind of um co-sign uh the character of this guy even though he's never met him like it's just it's just epic it's just pure short if he said it in a different way yeah a different way he's drunk you got to be ready for those repercussions yes yeah super ready but i mean he still shouldn't (laughs) This day and age, you should know not to say that, though. You know? Oh, also, yeah, well, well, he, he, he also that. wasn't, he, he was not on public. So, you should, there is no argument. You just shouldn't say it. But, of course, Brent Shop has a, has a debate what he was on. He was coming out of his car. He was on a bender. He didn't know someone was recording him. You just shouldn't say it in public. I'm pretty sure people say some pretty racy stuff in their own WhatsApp. I know I do, right? You don't want to see my WhatsApp chats. You don't want to see my iMessages. Uh, you don't want to see my emails, right? I say some nasty, crazy stuff. But again, it's private. It's between two consenting adults. It's between friends. It's between family members. You know, it's off bounds. No, no, no regard. But I'm not taking that conversation and then publicizing on here or publicizing or public or anywhere else. It's not. It's unbecoming, and it's also you know something that I necessarily wouldn't do because I've been brought up the right way and I'm not a dum dum. Like platform, yeah, yeah. He didn't know he's been filmed. Of course, they yeah. were filmed it. They filmed it from so, their ring. So should it be canceled for that? Well, yeah. What? So if you, he's saying, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about it happens it is what it is <laughs> well yeah that's crazy that they're taking them off pretty much all the all the radio stations but the itunes thing radio's that's kind of dead yeah who's who listening listen to the radio? fucking radio his the majority of the country music fans i guess listen to radio careers I mean, never been bigger i was about to say man. again the, the you guys don't listen to radio the audience, i listen to big boy neighborhood the audience okay. decides if he's canceled yeah of course not these radio stations i'm with the audience too man like now if apple pulled his music it's like come on dude you got charles manson on there you got all it's funny he says audience decides the whether you're canceled or not when you consider what happened to brian kellen right the audience didn't decide the cast media decided the company that they signed to in order to kind of you know um take some responsibility and pressure away from them producing a the show and getting sponsorships whatever they do i don't know what cast media does but cast media essentially fired brian from his own show because of the mess that he got himself in so the audience couldn't even get to the side because he was taken off of the equation and then kind of banished to patreon and vimeo which i guess is down at the moment and now back onto youtube again so effectively <laughs> he kind of signed his own death warrant in that regard but i just find it hilarious the optics of it all isn't it sitting between two black guys and then the topic comes up concerning a pretty poignant and um egregious uh use of a word that is loaded and has a lot of historical context that i'm obviously not a fan of as well i don't really think people should be referring to each other using that word in general even if you are black i'm not a fan of it especially for the uk we have a different perspective when it comes to that word but it's just interesting considering everything that's going on he's the one to jump up first and offer his opinion and basically ride for the guy co-sign him even though he's never met him it's absolutely epic and again it's it's kind of everything that you know and love about brendan shaw in it um you know racial expert cultural critic sports analyst supreme and <laughs> now the the protector of morgan wallen even though he's never met him absolutely epic okay what else do we have here da, 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 da. I think the, is it here? What, what's that? What's this? What's this time now? I think that might be it. You know, yeah, that's an hour. Let's leave it there. One hour, the other show. 
So it's the Yankees News English episode number 453. Thanks so much for checking in once again. Or 453 or 454. Uh, whatever it is, one of them. But regardless, thanks again for checking in tuning into the show. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. Make sure you smash that like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you're listening via anything else, um, you know, make sure you do the same. Share and subscribe, of course. Go on the Patreon, get involved there. New bonus show dropping at the end of the week. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Until then, take care. Be safe. Peace.